have Storm Weber with us, uh, reading her poetry. Um, she is Seattle-born, uh, internationally nurtured poet, writer, singer, and performer. She's presently a Jack Straw Writers Program Fellow, a Richard Hugo House Writer in Residence, city artist with the Mayor's Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs, and teaches with Arts Corps. She is uh, the founding artistic director of Voices Rising, LGBTQ of Color, Arts, and Culture. Um, she is featured in the award-winning documentary Venus Boys and has numerous international performance and cultural production credits. Storm is currently at work on her memoir, <coughs> Wild Tales of a Renegade Half-Breed Bull Dagger and her city artist multimedia performance project, Renegade Roots, Insurgent Souls. So, ladies and gentlemen, please lend me your ears to Storm Weber. Thank you so very much. I'm very honored to be here today, and uh, I would just like to say that I dedicate the reading of this poem to my mother, Pat Weber, my grandmother, Maxine Weber, and to the people of Gaza. The title of this poem is This Joy I Have. <clears throat> And it comes from a gospel song, the lyrics of which said, This joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it. The world can't take it away. There is a bomb in Gilead To make the wounded whole there is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. I saw a rainbow sign in the sky rising up from sorrow and the great unknown. In song, the voices of multitudes, many hues, all colors, spirit songs of ancestors ancient and well-loved yet living still in our soul's memory, sailing above our errors and our pride, in the beauty streaking across the firmament over this broken world, <clears throat> softly singing a song that remakes us. We did not come this far to stop now, weaving this world with cords of colors made from all of our heart's desires, all skins of many tones, our breaths rising and rising again, the knowledge that love triumphs eternally over death, singing from the bottom to the top, arching over sadness, joyous glissando rising over victories of good over evil. Harriet Tubman, her hands strong and steady as the tides, if you want to be free, keep going, her chant never wavering. I saw a rainbow sign written in music, and it carries me, and it carries you. All tones, all shades, full spectrum. This moment ripe with possibility. This fullness emptying, filling again. We have all we need. Every color is there. We have come so far. We cannot, we will not stop here. Now we will rise as that rainbow, rise over the sins of the past, lift ourselves past death, past grief, live our colors as they were meant to be lived. If you want to be free, keep going. I have Kimon Lieberman with us. Uh, Kimon holds a PhD in English, specializing in Vietnamese American literature from the University of California, Berkeley. Her poems and essays have appeared in Poetry Northwest, Prairie Schooner, Cordley West, Zizava, Calix, Three Penny Review, and the anthology AsianAmerica.net, Ethnicity, Nationalism, and Cyberspace. Currently, Kimon is a faculty member at Seattle's Lakeside School. Uh, she has taught writing and liberal arts at every level from fifth grade through college. And her first book, Breaking the Map, from which she'll be reading today, was published by Blue Begonia Press just last year. Ladies and gentlemen, lend me your ears, please, to come on. Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. Happy New Year. If you observe the Chinese zodiac, it's the year of the ox. It's just begun. Um, or if you're Vietnamese like my mother is, it's actually the year of the water buffalo. Either way, it's uh, f uh, meant, to, meant to signify industry and hard work ahead in this year, which hopefully will bode well for our economy. But... Uh, 
so year of the water buffalo and uh, and the celebration of the Lunar New Year date in Vietnamese is one that a lot of Vietnamese Americans, including my mother, celebrate with a mixture of both joy and sadness, um, joy for celebrating this holiday where you meet friends and family and cook lots of food and eat it um, and enjoy the new year ahead, but also sadness for the cultural ties to a country that they've left behind, which, as you are probably all aware, um, Vietnam is a country with a very turbulent history that involves a lot of division and separation and conflict. Um, in 1954, the, there was a line drawn across the center of the map at the 17th parallel of Vietnam that uh, divided the country in half and separated the North from the South, the communists from the capitalists, and meant that the, meant that the civil war between those two uh, would go on for many decades. The U.S. was intimately involved in that. And then in 1975, when those two halves were reunited, there were other divisions that occurred. There were millions of Vietnamese who scattered across the globe and found new lives in new countries because they were afraid for their lives in the communist regime that had taken place, um, that had taken over Vietnam. So a lot of division and separation and, and conflict in this history. So the poem I'm about to read titled Breaking the Map, it's the title poem from my first collection, is my attempting to grapple with this family history that I inherited as the daughter of a Vietnamese American. Um, what that all means to contemplate change and separation and division on such an epic scale. It's one thing to draw a line across a map or move a pushpin from one continent to another, but to actually think about what that means for the people experiencing that in their everyday lives, all of the change and work and hardship and sorrow when you separate neighbors from neighbors or families from families or an entire country of millions of people from their homeland. Um, that's, a, that's a different thing. And as I'm sure you are all aware of in this forum, that decisions as they look on paper are never as clean as they come out in the final spin. You put a lot of work and effort and thought into making a decision and they still affect people for better or for worse in many different ways. That's why we come together to make decisions in councils like this. So, uh, so with change and New Year's and uh, decisions and separations in mind and the history of a country with a line drawn across the middle, this is Breaking the Map. Breaking the Map. They began with a giant carbide rip saw at the designated parallel. The course was fibrous and deeply stratified. The first mile took 15 days. Little bits of rock slid from the selvages. Rivers, disconnected, spurted erratically from both ends. For railways and telephone lines, specialists were consulted. Luckily, no mountains. The project was broadcast live on national radio. Helicopters buzzed constantly overhead. Local hardware stores donated tools by the truckload. Workers hoisted crowbars, jackhammers, pickaxes, grappling hooks. Entire villages volunteered. Children distributed free lemonade. Grandparents stationed lawn chairs on either side. As the gap unzipped, Landowners on the divide had to think fast. Brothers tossed coins for the better half. Lovers hopped across together, discarding their old lives. Airlines held last-minute lotteries. At the terminus, an official ceremony with golden hammers. A thunderclap tore through the completed chasm. Startled, those remaining on the edges waved a mechanical goodbye. So happy new year and happy decision making. Thank you. We are happy to have Lori Blauner with us today. She is uh, the author of six books of poetry and two novels as well. She received an MFA from the University of Montana. Her poetry and fiction have appeared in various publications, including the New Republic, The Nation, The Georgia Review, The Seattle Review, The New Orleans Review, Poetry, and American Poetry Review. 
She has received an NEA grant as well as grants and awards from King County Arts Commission, Seattle Arts Commission, Artist Trust, and Centrum. And she lives in Seattle, and she'll be reading with us today. So, ladies and gentlemen, please lend me your ears for Lori Blauner. Hello. I'm going to, um, my poem is based on the fable about the emperor's new clothes, and it's got a little bit, it's a little bit of a love poem also, so that's appropriate. And it's called The Emperor's Wife. Belief is everything, yet I can't describe his new clothes. Pornographic as the winds touch, the pale abandoned ship of his body, empty, empty as the suggestion of smiles and vows. The whispering fills my head, light in the terrible room where we tried unsuccessfully to make children. I gather the wreck of him in my arms. Now air rests its hand against his rough thigh. He is laughing, waving, the all of him. He is happy in his strange fidelity of blood, swerving around, avoiding his floating heart, his political games, the innocence of good food. Moths swarm in the faces of bystanders who know there is nothing between them except their acquiescence, the sound of their breath, their grins loosened like kites. I too take risks, not the sun pushing my garments aside with its warm broken kisses, my hair uprooted by a breeze, but the way I stay watching him caress the world in its pure nakedness, knowing I can't stop him from walking out that door. Thank you. Even though spring hasn't yet arrived, I'm gonna jump ahead to early summer with this poem, since here in Seattle, spring and early summer and sometimes winter can all look the same. Excuse me, Donna, are you speaking right into the microphone? Is the microphone um, on? Okay. Is this better? Good. Okay. Uh, the title of this poem is On the Morning of the Summer Solstice. On the morning of the summer solstice, water seeps from the closet, making a small pond at the foot of the bed. It's fed from a hole in the roof, invisible to the eye, scornful of the tar and sheets of plastic my husband has layered there against the rain. It comes in drips that change their cadence, so we can't be lulled back to sleep keeps us on edge as we anticipate the variations. Plop, plop, plip, plock. From the sound, I know how the water travels, sliding down a beam, insinuating itself in the wood along the way, separating at cracks in the plaster to nosedive in a bucket, or slink its way along a hanger to spread a Rorschach blot against the lining of my coat. Then it reaches our shoes, floods the hiking boots, the cross trainers, saturates the straps of my unused sandals, and in the corner surrounds a derelict umbrella. There's a smell of mildew, of rotting wood, a dampness at the windowsills. Soon, we will sample mushrooms that will jut through the moldings, count the salmon spawning in the open dresser doors, inflate a raft, and trace patterns in the bedspread with our oars while we wait for August. Thank you so much. Today's poet is Rachel Dilworth. Rachel's first book of poems, The Wild Rose Asylum, Poems of the Magdalene Laundries of Ireland, was chosen by Rita Dove for the 2008 Akron Poetry Prize and will be published this fall by University of Akron Press. Her poems have also appeared in numerous journals, including Agony Online, Triquarterly, and American Literary Review and are forthcoming in several others. She has received a Fulbright Fellowship to Ireland for creative writing, Yale's Clapp Fellowship for poetry, commendation in the UK National Poetry Competition, a Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Prize, and scholarship support from the Breadloaf and Napa Valley Writers Conferences. And she's a 2009 Jack Straw writer. And I'm pleased to introduce Rachel. Thank you very much, Donna. And I want to say thank you very much to Councilman Lakata and everyone on the council for having me here today. I'm very pleased 
uh, and honored to be here. And I also wanted to say how appreciative I am of this um, effort to carve out time and, and space on a, a regular basis to, um, to make poetry sort of part of the business of the community, which I think is just terrific. So thank you very much for well, that as well. I agree with you, and I believe that uh, Councilmember Lakata takes all credit or deserves all credit for that. It's one of the wonderful things that he has uh, brought to the City Council. Am I correct in believing that you're a Seattle resident? Um, I'm living in Gig Harbor right now, oh, Gig but Harbor. have been a Seattle resident in the past, yes. Okay, well, because our agenda is really brief, maybe we can have a little bit of conversation, but I, we'd love to hear your poem now. Okay, um, and I thought I would read a poem today uh, that is from the forthcoming book, The Wild Rose Asylum, Poems of the Magdalene Laundries of Ireland. And just for, for anyone here in Seattle who might not be familiar with what the Magdalene Laundries were, uh, they were also called Magdalene Asylums and were residential and work institutions, uh, working laundry facilities that um, existed for the care, um, spiritual and moral reformation and containment really of um, supposedly fallen or, or wayward women. Um, and in the 20th century, that really seems to have encompassed quite a variety of women and girls who were institutionalized in these places for years for a number of different reasons. Um, and the, the institutions were established and run in Ireland. They existed elsewhere as well, but in Ireland by Protestant and Catholic philanthropists. And then from about the middle of the 19th century throughout the 20th century, uh, also by, by four female orders of the Catholic Church. And in the 20th century, it was really convents attached to, to those orders that ran quite substantially large institutions of this kind. So the poem I'm going to read today uh, does not explicitly address the institutions, but it is uh, part of a series that is woven throughout the book called The Body Sonnets and makes reference uh, in its imagery to a, a bird that, as far as I'm aware, we don't have a whole lot of here in Seattle, but our sister city in Ireland is full of them. Um, and hopefully everyone knows what our sister city is, but if you don't, it's Galway, which is a, a beautiful, um, wonderful, really vibrant town on the West Coast, uh, very vibrant arts community. It's very green and rainy, so an awful lot like an, another city we all know and love here, close to home. So this is a little reaching out across land and water today to one of Seattle's sister cities. Body Sonnets 1, Credibility. So much yourself that even the river is you. Length fathomed as a curve that stirs the light. Muscles wing-swept and slow to be moved. Your very name, Swan, is absolute. No part of you is mystery to itself, not breast, nor skin, nor wind-delighting eye. No impulse strange to you if seldom felt, nor missed, nor lost with opportunity. Time blooms in you, whole evenings of milkweed and wet earth billow new, new, as your body makes its own white space, builds a pure, relentless physical truth. Credibility of light, you are the star, clear argument that justifies the river. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. But today I'm going to read a poem called Talent Night. Talent Night. After the rush for seats, when a gaggle of tripods, necks craned, line the aisles, and the red eyes of cameras blink their readiness in the dimmed auditorium, the spotlight circles the fifth grade MC, who tests the microphone with a knock-knock joke. Satisfied, he signals the curtain to open on the first act. A tiny girl, someone's child, perches on a stool, squeaks a song off note, is gently cued by the audience when she forgets the words. Then the applause, its surge and roll, moves like a single-celled organism, elemental and enduring, gathering momentum for the 39 acts to go. Thank you very much. Our poet today is, as all the poets so far this year have been, part of the Jack Straw Writers Program, a local arts program that showcases the work of area writers. 
Angela Martinez D is a poet and spoken word artist, educator and activist, organizer and MC. At age 15, she was a member of Is Isang Mahal Arts Collective and since then has been instrumental in the development of many young Seattle poets. A founding member and director of You Speak Seattle, the Northwest premier youth literary arts organization and six time coach of the Seattle Youth Poetry Slam team, which regularly ranks among the nation's top 10 Angela has performed and taught creative writing at, at venues nationwide. She also performs under the name El Dia and is part of the Filipina hip hop duo First Quarter Storm. She was also a 2007 2008 Poet Populist nominee. And today, in honor of Earth Day, Angela will read a poem about Earth Day. Thank you, Donna, and thank you, Nick. This poem is entitled Human Causes. In the 1970s, they dropped the news like bombs over Baghdad. Before too long, the earth will burn. Scientists were countered and silenced, the phrase global warming erased in official documents. Today, the earth suffocates in swirling clouds of carbon dioxide. The feeling is familiar. Asthmatic since the age of three, when I would choke on my own breath, mom would hook me to the ventilator. But there's no solution like that for our planet. No giant ventilator in the sky to steal from its orbit, nor can we stop the Earth spinning long enough to place a mask over her gorgeous, cloud-covered face. A quarter of all children in Harlem have asthma. This is Homeland Security's most significant breach yet. Hurricane season a-coming. Climatologists have made their findings, yet their hands are tied. The U.S. never ratified Kyoto. And now that the protocols passed outdated, the temperature is rising and secondhand smoke will kill more than a million species in our ecosystem. We will be extinct. How much more serious must this get? And why are the deciders gone golfing? What is the difference between effect and effect? Answer, the global poor. Those whom warming oceans and changing winds will affect most and yet those who have had the least effect on the current ecological situation. How can we undo this gunner's knot? Global warming tied to a global war, bred on black gold and white ego, yet we still pump by the gallon with abandon, acting like there's a lot to waste. Environmental consciousness must be raised. Stop playing naive. Recycle like your life depends on it. Recycle because your life depends on it. If we promote only the use of renewable energy, force the automobile industry to cap emissions and rethink its greed, the survival of the planet becomes a commercial priority. An uninhabitable world can buy and sell nothing. Some experts suggest more highway tolls, but let's hit the American people where it will hurt the most. Ask Fox News to disable the use of MySpace, cancel American Idol, and every NASCAR race until the CO2 emissions rate drops 75% or more. The levels are rising every day. The tides are rising too. Melting ice sheets are predicted to increase sea level a half meter in this century alone. Coral reefs will be forced to give up the ghost. We both thrive at the sea's surface but the new depths may drown them with our hopes. If there is a chance of salvation to be had in legislation, let it not be our last resort. Thank you. Thank you. And Peggy was a 2002 Jack Star writer. She also writes a weekly column from the Ballard News Tribune at large in Ballard and a blog of the same name for seattlepi.com. She fac facilitates writing groups for Cancer Lifeline and is a contributor to Crosscut.com, writing on neighborhood issues. Thanks. This poem is in response to one by Naomi Shihob Nye, which was called So Much Happiness. But on the day that I sat down to write it, it was the day after there had been a, a bicycle accident uh, near my home that took the life of a man on his way to work at the University of Washington. And so my response was not about happiness. The weight. It is difficult to know what to do with so much sadness. It is a weight heavier than the oldest quilt. 
Amazing that the invisible has so much gravity. We try to move it off our chests, place the sadness in a handmade urn on the fireplace mantel, in hands around a paper cup sheltering a cheap white candle, flowers propped between sidewalk and light pole, even though the bloodstains are in the street. Handwritten notes and bundled flowers allow us to shift the sadness a bit, juggle it from hand to hand, hot potato distracting us with pain. Oh, for a burn that could be cooled by ice. Sadness is not so easily deterred. We are choking on it. There is nothing to do but try to endure. Note a pulse of pleasure at the orange of sunrise despite yourself. Draw warmth from the person next to you. Appreciate that your own heart still pushes blood. It's hard to survive when someone else does not, but the heart's work shouldn't go to waste. One morning, the smell of coffee brewing will be pleasant. The shower will not just be the best place to cry. Most of us do recover from sadness. The grief doesn't float downstream with the ashes and rose petals. It doesn't stay nailed to the light pole, ink fading. Sadness walks us home, sits on our chest. It's not a matter of knowing what to do, but how to keep breathing while we wait. Thank you. Thank you very much. Molly Tenenbaum. Molly oh. is the author of Now from Bear Star Press, By a Thread from Van West and Company, and the chat books Blue Willow, Old Voile, and Story. Her old time banjo CD is titled Instead of a Pony. Molly enjoys bicycling between Seattle's Ravenna neighborhood, where she lives, and North Seattle Community College, where she teaches music and writing. Thanks. Um, so I picked a poem that's, uh, well, it's one of a series of ab about different kinds of civilizations that we might create uh, if the artists were creating civilizations. Uh, this might be one of them. But there's a few drawbacks to it, I don't know. My metal civilization. The walls are made of every metal art. Braidings of rose yellow gold, sweeps of brushed pewter, feather fine chasings, garlands of galloping iron. And overwrought with decoration, ormolu fleur de lis, spirals of burnished brass dots, fluted lead, copper leaf shirrings, panels in bronze of fruits and flowers. Inset with every color and shape. Opal carbuncles, agate and taglio, lacings of kingfisher jade, columns of mutton fat jade, swirls dotted garnet, each stone smaller than a flea. And lapped behind hammered roses, leafed over by beaten bronze laurel, are hundreds of doors. Some like pin tips, so small you can't see them. Some so leviathan huge you can't see them. Some under the paw of a bronze relief leopard. Some in the laugh of a bronze relief monkey. Some wound around with shining vines, but all you see are the vines. In each wall, thousands of doors. And for every one you find, thousands more are hidden. And for every one you open, thousands more hinges sleep folded. The walls glow in flickers, deep black in the creases, no doors to be seen. And maybe you haven't opened a one for all that you've opened, not one at all. Slumber now, here in the corner. Here is your pallet of straw. Here your warm patchwork cover. Your mother sewed it herself of what spilled from her hamper of rags. Thanks. Thank you. Pleased to have Allison Green with us, who is the author of um, the novel, novel Half Moon Scar and stories and poems published in a number of literary journals. Uh, three poems were recently published in Jumpstart, an anthology from Northwest Renaissance, 
Allison chairs the Arts and Humanities Division at Highline Community College, and we're happy to have her here. Everyone, please lend your ears to Allison Green. Thank you. This is a sonnet, and it's called Barista Love. The ones who came before her had their charms. A bell whose double earrings and tattoos were quite as lovely as Bernard's blue hair and scars. But I moved on. My first true loves were two. Elaine, who did the hard work of the pull, and Sarah Beth, who made the pretty milk. She wore her necklines low, her poodle skirts were full. They got their scholarships to Smith and swore they would be back, but I was on my own. The barista at my bakery was, I learned, a poet of espresso, and amen, a poet of the word as well, and earned her wage by knowing drinks and names and more. Her crema brought the Mormons in the door. Thank you. <laughs> 